so we're looking at Cezanne, and as usual, we're taking a kind of leisurely <laughs> approach where we you know, take as long as we need to consider any individual artists. We're not trying to cover that many artists. The diversity, uh, which I'm enjoying very much, is coming through your tutorial presentations, which bring up discussion of artists from other countries, other parts of the world. It's all very uh, enjoyable to me, I have to say. So we're looking at Cezanne's mature style. And uh, this is one of his paintings of the Mont Saint-Victoire, the one particular mountain in Provence near Aix, Aix-en-Provence, the, the, the town, the major town next to where Cezanne used to live. He's returned in this latter part of his life, his post-Paris phase, back to the place he came from. So he's painting landscape and his interest is not in, I mean, some people get inspiration from painting a, as landscape painters, from painting a landscape that's very exotic and different and new, you know, the, the novelty of it is what inspires them. But that's the opposite of what is the case with Cezanne. He's dealing with a landscape that he knows in a very intimate way, if you like. It's uh, the landscape of childhood. I mean, you could almost liken it to uh, a language, you know, the language that you spoke when you were a baby. You, you have a different relationship to that language than you do to languages that you learned uh, as, as a grown-up. So, you know, the, 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 the landscape you knew as a child would be a very different landscape. So quite different, say, from Gauguin going to Tahiti, something like that. Let's put it that way. So this mountain really dominates uh, a lot of the area in that part of, of, of uh, Provence. You know, from quite a long way around, you'd, you'd have a view of this mountain. It doesn't always look quite like this from different perspectives, but there you are. So it's a subject he came back to on a number of occasions. I'll, I'll show you several of his work, partly to show how his work changes over time um, in the, the, the latter part of his life. So this is the earliest of the ones that I want to look at. This is the, the Mont Saint-Victoire painting that's in the Courtauld Institute galleries in London. Choosing a mountain as your subject, it's already a little bit different from the characteristic subject matter of the Impressionists. You can imagine Monet confined a perfectly valid subject for a painting in just some reflections on the surface of a river water, something very transient like that. But here is Cezanne at the level of the choice of subject matter is something post-Impressionist already. He's choosing a very solid, unchanging form of a mountain. He is still concerned in his late, later works with the, the surface or skin of nature that the Impressionists love, but he's also wanting something a bit more than that. He talks about wanting to realize the motif, he wants to kind of come back to some solid, unchanging thing and try to, to, to get it somehow in his painting. So appearances are still important, but underlying structure uh, it, it, it is also important. Coming back again and again to the same subject is uh, in repeatedly in different canvases is part of his attempt to, to, to deal with this. You could compare it in a way to Monet's series works, you know, the, the Haystacks and the Rouen Cathedral where he comes back to the same subject, except that Monet is concerned with the instant, and that here with Cezanne there is a sort of concern with something more monumental than that. Um, or I think you could say in this work he's thematizing a contrast between something static and unchanging and then other things which are much more mobile and uh, you know, you, you see a difference between the, the branches of the tree and the mountain, partly because they're put so close together within the painting. Solidity, 
of the mountain, the restlessness of the branches. You get a kind of play of the branches from two opposing trees. One tree we see, its branches here, but another tree we don't see, the branches come in, cut by the edge. Suzanne is not really that interested in the Japanese print, but maybe this is a, a, a little bit of a hint of some such um, parallel at least. And the tree, the trees, branches from the two sides sort of meet and almost sort of touch hands in the, the center. The, there's a kind of play of forms meeting in the middle. Uh, and they also seem to curiously follow the, the contour of the, the mountainscape behind. Uh, forms rhyme one with another. You can see very much then Cezanne concerned with in creating order. With the pa a painting is a place you impose order on nature, or a painting has to have its own internal order to make sense. Nature uh, could be disorderly or have an, an order that we can't really see on the surface, but um, in the world of art, we, the artists, are responsible for ensuring a, a kind of coherence. There's a, a sort of 2D design quality, if you like. He's very much concerned to create that order on a flat surface, a sense of forms on a flat surface making a coherence. But at the same time, he, he does give us a, a, a very strong sense of the third dim dimension. You know, it's not like the flatness of a Van Gogh or, a, or especially of a Gauguin painting. We do have a sense of solid things. The mountain is a solid thing. But at the same time, we have two-dimensional pattern. This is something I was saying at the very beginning, talking about Cezanne last week, that sense of him as an artist who wants almost too much. You know, he wants both the three-dimensional and the two-dimensional. He wants to, to, to keep everything, all the juggling all the, the balls in play at the same time. Little patches of, cal of, of paint that help sort of build up the image, whether in the sky or in the form of the mountain, especially the plain in the foreground, you get all these sort of diamond shapes really, sort of diagonals and, and patches that sort of build a sense of space, there's a viaduct there, little li lines are quite important. He's systematizing or simplifying the forms of the landscape, giving you a, a kind of synoptic vision of it, not trying to tell you about each little detail. The tree here seems to conveniently sort of bend at an angle, almost to create a kind of right angle with the form of the mountain. Um, the, the line of the mountain, it's a little hard to follow where it goes behind the tree. It seems to come down at a, a lower level here. Yeah. This play between two-dimensional design and three-dimensional design, it's there at the level of the, the brushwork as well. So if, you, if we were looking at the actual painting, uh, because of the way Cezanne paints, we're very aware of the little patches of brushwork as brushwork. We read it as a made object. You would see some of the brushstrokes representing the, the thing furthest away in the painting, the sky, actually overlap the brush strokes representing the thing which is probably the closest in space in the painting, the, the branches of the tree. Uh, so he's knitting together depth and foreground, creating a kind of unity over the two-dimensional canvas surface. There's no awkward um, illusionistic holes in the space of the painting. That's one of the ways he create, creates unity. you get a, a sense of reworking a little bit. Um, maybe that creates the sense of the branches as in motion there, but 
even with the branch you get a sense of reworking of contours restated um, what's what's going on there well um, in part this is just how you would work on on any painting you have to um, come back to things that you've already worked on before and, and change them you know if you, anyone who's made a a study uh, from a life model or a still life will have had that experience that you thought everything worked over here but then when you start to join it up with what you did over here it doesn't quite cohere you have to restate those contours partly because you are bringing together information from different viewpoints in any that's how these inconsistencies work uh, how they appear uh, because you're looking in slightly different directions when you're dealing with different parts of the motif, adding together information from slightly different viewpoints. So yeah, these inconsistencies uh, will appear and no matter how committed you are as a painter to working from nature, uh, you can look very intensely at the motif you want to paint, but sorry, when you're actually looking at your canvas, then you're blind to that motif. You're just relying on your memory of what you were just looking at. You can't be lo looking at the motif and looking at your canvas at the same time. Even if your canvas is on an easel right in front of the landscape, that's, that, that is, blindness <laughs> will, will be there. So th there's this uh, artificiality of the process or, or kind of arbitrariness that's there in, 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 in any kind of process of painting, even the most naturalistic in style. So maybe what Suzanne is doing is to try and acknowledge to you something about the nature of the process of painting. You're seeing not just a landscape, you're seeing uh, a process of trying to represent the, the landscape. It's a process perhaps that never quite comes to an end. This is a m sort of modern intuition, if you like, the sense that representation is, is never fully over. We never can fully make present the world in our images of the world. It's always uh, almost, uh, it could be almost even arbitrary to decide when the process of painting is over. Is it ever really over? Could it ever really be finished? Another way of looking at this is to say that Cezanne is introducing a time dimension into his images. You know, the, the great achievement of the Renaissance is to, uh, through uh, the development of systematic perspective, one point perspective, is to create this unity of space, an illusion of a, a spatial window through to another world as real as ours. But uh, the price paid for that is that you have to focus just on one moment in time. Uh, you can't uh, easily tell different moments in a narrative, for instance, if you've got a unified sense of space. That's different, say, from Chinese painting. So, in the modern era with artists like Cezanne, you're starting to see a desire to bring back temporality into the world of painting by restating contours, you're somehow letting the viewer see that you're restating contours, you're, you're acknowledging that painting is a process over time, the making of it is a process over time, the viewing of it is a process over time, whereas with an illusionistic painting it's almost like you're, you're capturing an instant. Impressionism al almost takes that to the very limit, you know, of capturing one instant. Of course, that's a, that's a, a fiction in a way. You know, a Monet painting of one instant of light in a natural landscape wasn't made in one instant. It was made over time, and uh, although he may have worked from the motif, he probably finished it in the studio later. So it's a fabrication, a falsehood at, at some level. Maybe this is a more realistic in that sense. It's realistic as to the process of what making a painting is like. It tells you that it is a process to start with. When artists hide away their brush work, as so much artwork of the Renaissance tradition 
did, erasing your brushwork, uh, then you 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 you're you you as if your your attention is not drawn to the process of painting. This is um, then something that an artist like Cezanne has broken down from. That's all very interesting. You start to be there with the painter when the painting is being made. You're you're kind of seeing some of the choices the painter has had to make. It, your engagement with the painting is at a kind of meta level. It's not just about mountains, it's about paintings. And you're kind of trusted as a companion to the artist to be able to see how the, the process should go, the decisions that should be made. It's a kind of art that is about art as well as about nature. It's a, got a meta level um, kind of interest in Art. It acknowledges the artifice of art, if you like. In Chinese painting, traditionally, um, you do have much more of a sense of, of, of time. You know, it's, it's only within the Renaissance tradition that, in the West, that you really get this. Um, abolition of time in, the, in the, the world of the painting. You know, when you look at a piece of Chinese painting, you're aware of each individual brush stroke that was made, and therefore you have a sense of the temporality of the painting of, as a thing made over time. You, you can, because ev everyone, every literate person in this time period, this is from the Yuan, Yuan Dynasty, would have handled a brush at, for writing, so they, they have some sense themselves of, of how to make marks using ink on a, on a flat surface, absorbent surface. They can easily empathize with the artist's uh, task, see the work as something occurring over time. If you have a hand scroll, of course, you're unrolling it section by section over time. Temporality is foregrounded there in, a, in another way. So I'm not trying to say that Cezanne was influenced by Zhao Mengfu or <laughs> something like that. I'm trying to say, um, you know, yeah, th there's nothing so really alien and strange about what Cezanne is doing. It's kind of an, the norm in other traditions, perhaps, to allow temporality to be foregrounded in art making. And then this is the, the uh, an example of the Renaissance tradition with very systematized uh, perspective of space. This is a, a just chosen at random a Crivelli painting. But I want you to have a sense of one point perspective as being a fiction. First of all, because you know we have two eyes, we see the world from two viewpoints, not from one single viewpoint. We don't see the world from a static viewpoint. We're always moving. Even if you're sit sitting in a lecture theatre, you're, you're, you can still move your head around. Your eyes will move even if your head doesn't move. Uh, even if your eyes don't move, as I say, you have two of them. <laughs> so um, it's always um, putting together information from more, more than one viewpoint. So this is this is more fictional or false, if you like, than uh, than what Cezanne is doing. So going back to the Mont Saint Victoire theme, um, to look at a few of the works from the latter part of his life, where he comes back to the same motif, and partly because it's such a familiar motif by then, something he's treated many times. Uh, that gives him some kind of freedom to, to move towards an abstraction. There's something very modern about these very late works that he produces. I was following last week uh, an idea by Mayor Shapiro that sees the earlier phases of Cezanne's work as uh, an attempt to create greater order in the painting as a way of dealing with the kind of very raw emotive uh, quality of his earlier work. You know, it's a kind of suppression or repression or somehow control 
of uh, the disorderly emotional expression of his early work. Um, and you could say maybe with these later works, because he has now solved that problem, he's developed a style which does have a kind of ordered quality to it, that he can therefore relax a little bit and let the more spontaneous and emotive side of his work come out. There's something about these late works which is very ordered, very grid-like uh, at one level, but then that very uh, ordered quality allows a spontaneity at another level. So we, we start to see uh, a, maybe a, a more dynamic balance between those polarities. It's such a recognizable motif that he can afford to make it a little bit illegible. We still know what it is we're looking at. I mean, this is a fundamental kind of uh, discovery of modern artists, you know, that y you actually only need to give a certain number of cues to your viewer as to the subject matter, and then they will get it. Yeah, that, that's all you need. And then you can just focus on the painting as painting, perhaps. So building up the image of this sort of patchwork quality. It's a little bit flatter than the early one we looked at, but still there is a sense of space in it, of three-dimensionality. So this is the, that was the Philadelphia one. This is the Zurich one. They're all from the last few years of his life. Um, an issue comes up about whether they are finished or not, you know, works left in an artist's studio at their death. It's a little bit hard sometimes to work out if they really are finished or not, particularly with an artist like Cezanne. This one, even compared to, to the last one, the Zurich one, is uh, there's a lot of the empty white, uh, you know, of the, the canvas. Of course, the surface would have been prepared with a white ground but he's allowing that ground to, to show through. It's fairly thinly painted, quite loosely painted. It's got this sort of patchwork structure, but there's spontaneity too. Here, there's actually dripping paint. This is really, uh, I think it's possibly the first time in the whole history of Western art that I can think of that paint is just allowed to drip like that. Um, there is, you, you see splash paint in a fair number of 20th century art, artworks after this time. You can see paintings by Matisse, for instance, where there's splash paint. Later, of course, you have things like Jackson Pollock and so forth. But even the most spontaneous paintings of an artist like Monet, I don't think you would see splash paint. They look very spontaneous, but actually there's a control of the brush going on. This is actually allowing a random effect to, 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 to occur. Of course, there's this question of whether he would have painted over it later if, if he'd come back to the, to, to the image. But it does, as it stands, have a certain kind of resolved quality to it. One more example. So this is also in a Swiss collection. This is in Basel. Oh, just to give you the, the mountain in a photographic image. This is taken roughly from where Cezanne would have viewed the mountain when he, he did a number of his works. I want to do the same thing, look at a, a theme that he came back to more than once in respect to the card players. He, it's not a theme that he has so many versions as the Mont saint Victoire, but he does come back to it more than once. So let's just see. It's a different kind of subject, a figure painting, an interior, rather than a landscape. Let's just go through the whole sequence, then we can come back.
there are four altogether from the court uh, from the Barnes Foundation in Philadelphia from New York from the Courtauld in London and from Paris from the I think the Jeu de Pont. I, I mean the sorry the um, uh, you say Orsay Well, I, I think it's pretty clear how they differ. They become much more simplified. It's a sequence of images that doesn't go on to the very end of his life, so you don't see that kind of fragmentation, or almost cubist quality that you get in the late Mont Saint Victoire painting. But still, it tells you something about the the trajectory of his work. It's a work towards greater simplification. So, little details like this pipe rack on the wall behind. Uh, that's all disappears. All these uh, the clutter of details disappear. The pipe rack's still there. It's not anymore. And of course, the number of figures in the painting is reduced. Five, four, but well, maybe two is enough. This is more anecdotal, the sense of a card game. The subject matter is interesting. I mean, he's taken uh, inspiration from a painting that comes from the studio of the Lenin brothers, uh, 17th century French artist, that he would have known quite well because it's in a museum of uh, the museum in Aix, where he lived, the local museum. Uh, but he's returned to that theme in his own way. Uh, the, the subject matter of card playing, uh, it shows people very concentrated and static, so that's some advantage of the theme for him. By these final two versions, he's got to the idea of yeah, introducing a certain symmetry to the image. He introduces symmetry but then slightly upsets the symmetry. Two figures facing each other but then once we start to look at the details the symmetry breaks down but almost in an interesting way you know here this hat is different from that hat here the brim of the hat is downward facing here the brim is sort of upward facing so it's a kind of, again it's a sort of it's not symmetry but it's a sort of paralleling they're different in a kind of 180 degrees <laughs> difference not randomly different actually both the mother and father of Cezanne were originally involved in the business of uh, hats later the father becomes a banker but uh, uh, hats are in the family background. Even the colour, well a sort of slightly purplish quality coming up here against the yellow here. Yeah. You see him organising like the angle of the pipe and the angle of the, uh, of the shirt, you know, the, the accents linking or even the accent here of the of the ta tablecloth, or a stiff cloth on top of the table. Hierarchical, symmetrical profile views. But seeing what he leaves out, tell you, telling you what is important to him, the basic forms are more important to him than the story, the narrative. Emphasis is on form, not just on content. Lots of, oh sorry, yeah, lots of um, verticals emphasize, yet it's slightly off vertical, they're not quite, um, quite vertical, same with the horizontals are not quite horizontal. That um, chair back, for instance, 
but the, also the slightly wonky quality of the table. It almost encourages us to sort of get involved with the world of the painting as if we want to, <coughs> to enter the painting and kind of slightly be involved ourselves in putting everything back in, uh, in the right position when things are slightly off. You know? Somehow we're engaged in a very tactile way in the world of the painting. It, it, there's a certain dynamism that's uh, there at a subtle level that breaks up the, the symmetry or the, the, the order of the horizontals and verticals. There are distortions of forms, you know, the, the figures, he's very tall. He was tall. I think this is the, the gardener of Cezanne. He paints him on his own on other occasions. Let's take our break there a little bit earlier than we sometimes do, and then uh, come back to look at this still life painting.